and welcome to another exciting lecture for human sexuality. In this lecture, we are going to convert into short-term mating strategies. So this chapter is a little bit longer than the previous chapters. Um, so it's, it's going to be a bit longer of a lecture. Some weeks we've got shorter lectures, some weeks we've got longer. It's one of the benefits of being able to be online is I don't have to structure the lecture 100% to the fixed class time. But what that does mean is some of these lectures get a little bit longer. So in this one, we'll be talking about theories of men's short-term mating, the costs and benefits of it. Uh, the, we'll look at adaptive problems men must solve for short-term mating. We'll look at evidence of evolved short-term mating strategies. We'll then look at women's short-term mating because they do it as well. We'll look at the costs as well as some of the possible benefits and evidence. And then we'll look at the contextual effects on short-term mating strategies. So one thing before we get into it, we need to look at, at some things relating to why short-term mating exists. So first, and that is, first and most important, parental care is not universal. Uh, majority of species on the planet do not engage in any form of parental care. That's because parental care is costly. It takes a lot for the parents to, to take care of the offspring. Uh, there's, there's, they're basically, the parents are now investing in the offspring rather than investing in increased reproduction. So they're, they're giving up the opportunities to find additional mates, giving up the opportunities for additional reproductive output in order to dedicate resources towards the offspring they have. Why would that be? Why would any species engage in it then? Because it gets us ensuring the survival of offspring increases the chances of them surviving and reproducing themselves. So in species where there is parental care, it's there because for those species, at least going back evolutionarily, it is more advantageous to forego as many mating opportunities as possible in order to care for fewer offspring, but ensure that those offspring have a greater chance of survival and reproduction. So let's look at a couple different examples. Let's look at something like um, sea turtles. Um, sea turtles, they, they lay hundreds of eggs. Those, those babies hatch, they make their way to the ocean. M many of them don't even make it to the ocean. They get hit off by predators. Then the ones that do make it to the ocean, they get eaten. Up, eaten. Basically, I, on average, for every uh, time a, a female goes and lays eggs, it is on average less than one of those. On average, less than one of those is going to survive to adulthood and reproduce themselves. So even though they, these, they're, they're not raising these offspring, they're having so many that it kind of it, it cancels out. On the other hand, we'll look at something like elephants who spend a lot of time caring for their, their offspring as they grow up, but they don't have as many offspring. Again, on average, you're going to get about the same amount of reproductive output over a lifespan. The only difference becomes that there's, there's fewer mating opportunities and fewer offspring produced in the ones that are raising their offspring. So parental investment. Um, it's investment that increases the offspring's reproductive, reproductive success at the cost of the parent's ability to invest elsewhere. If you're investing resources into offspring, then you can't invest resources into producing more offspring, or at least maybe you can, you just can't dedicate as much resources because there's a finite amount of resources you can invest. You, if you're investing some of that finite amount into current offspring, that means you're, you're reducing the amount you can invest in producing 
more offspring. And that is the basics of parental investment theory. That's another one of Trivers' theories. I mentioned before Trivers had big three big theories. Parental investment theory is one of them. When it comes to mothers versus fathers, this is something we talked about um, in the previous chapters, but let's look at it a bit more when it comes to, to why mothers provide more parental care than fathers do. Mothers provide more parental care for various different reasons. Um, but we go back to the, the original thing we talked about. The primary reason is the initial investment. Mothers have more of an initial investment. Therefore, it, it should stand to reason that as time goes on, they'll evolve other things that increase their investment in the offspring more. But there's more than just the 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 initial investment. There's things that happen after that. One of the things that's after that is what's referred to as the paternity uncertainty hypothesis. That means it basically comes down to species with internal fertilization. So we're not talking about species like fish where the males fertilize eggs, um, but even then they've, there's some issues with paternity uncertainty, but the, which is why most males after fertilizing eggs will hang out near them to make sure other males can't fertilize them. But in species with internal fertilization, mothers are going to be 100% sure they contributed genetics to the offspring. The exception to this is when we've got swapped at birth and stuff like that, but we're talking about 100% sure under normal circumstances. We're not talking about the extremely, extremely rare exceptions. So a mother who's raising an offspring we're talking about, let's talk about humans here. A mother who's raising an offspring is pretty much 100% certain that that offspring is hers. Fathers, on the other hand, can't be sure because there's no guarantee, there's no certainty, and we'll talk about this later, but there is no certainty that they will, that there was 0% chance that the partner was faithful or the the zero percent chance that the partner was unfaithful. There's no 100% certainty that that partner what didn't have a extra pair copulation, as it's referred to, having a opportunity to to mate with someone else. So all else being the same, when it comes to this, parental investment will be less profitable for fathers than mothers because the fathers aren't can't be 100% sure that that offspring is theirs. There's a chance that they're investing resources in an offspring that's not th theirs, something referred to as cuckoldry. We'll come back to that later. Next is the mating cost opportunity. So there's a trade-off between in mating effort between men and women. Uh, for women, the cost of foregoing additional matings is usually small. That is because she can only have so many mating opportunities. Uh, while she is uh, pregnant with one, we're talking about in, in species where the woman gets pregnant, while she's pregnant with one, she cannot get pregnant again. So there is less opportunities to reproduce. So foregoing mating opportunities isn't as big of a deal. That also being said, there, there's the there's always the fact that when women are fertile, it is easier for them to find mating opportunities, something else we'll talk about when it comes to short-term mating. So them foregoing one mating opportunity isn't going to be as big of a deal, at least evolutionarily. For men, the, the cost of foregoing mating opportunities can be large. It can be really large. Every missed mating opportunity is a potentially missed opportunity to reproduce. Again, where women can only get pregnant once at a time, one time, and then the, they can't get pregnant again while they're, while they're already pregnant. Men who have more mating opportunities can potentially have unlimited number of offspring. They can have a mating opportunity with another woman who is not pregnant. And so miss mating opportunities can be relatively large, especially since there is 
for most males, there is less mating opportunities than there is for females. We'll talk about the caveat to that later, but for most males, there's less. So parental investment can be less profitable for males because if you do parental investment, you're foregoing the, some possible mating opportunities. This is why men who are more attractive as short-term mates, and again, we'll, we'll look at that. W what do I mean by that? Um, who are more attractive. Sorry, it, it deleted some things. Um, we'll look at that a bit later when we're looking at... Okay, what is going on with the slide? Okay. Men who are more attractive as short-term mates often parent less. Uh, so when we look at, at value and situational differences and who is looked for as short-term partners, the, the qualities that males have that are looked for as short-term partners, that, that actually leads them to being more of a short-term relationship than a long-term. They will parent less. It is because they, for them, it is more valuable to, to forego parenting to have more mating opportunities. And in species where males have very few mating opportunities, parental investment becomes more frequent. In humans, this is the case. Um, we do have short-term mating as humans, but when we look at it compared to many other species, m humans have less short-term mating opportunities so having long-term mating opportunities becomes more valuable. And because that becomes more valuable, parental investment becomes more valuable. And then in species where men, males do invest in parenting, it actually mainly reflects mating effort. This is an interesting one. So what does this mean? Think about this for a second. What does it mean that males invest in parenting as a as a form of mating effort. It obviously doesn't mean anything like th that they're that they're raising children to have mating effort with them. No, that that's that don't go there with the twisted mind. I sometimes have students go there. No, what we're talking about here is that in relationships, men who are who exhibit more parenting and better parenting tend to have more mating opportunities with their long-term partner. So being an, an, a, a, a good father gets them more mating opportunities. So in a sense, being a good father, investing in parenting becomes a way in actually investing in mating opportunities because doing that gets them more mating opportunities with their long-term partner. Relating to that, let's look at some cross-cultural differences in infant care. Most American dads are pretty typical in their parenting. Um, Americans aren't especially unusual in that fathers typically provide little direct infant care. Direct paternal infant care is, is rare or modest in all known cultures. Um, they do, males, some males do provide a lot of direct care, but for the majority, typical fathers don't provide as much direct care as mothers do. They provide relatively little direct care. They, they, women spend 10 to 20 times more than men in direct infant care, holding, feeding, changing, doing those types of things. Um, one of the, the, the largest, actually, is Akka dads tend to spend the most at about 20%. So even the, the most, the culture that has the fathers that spend the most direct care time, it's still women in that culture spend five times more than men do. The, the thing is, though, men do contribute in many other substantial ways. They provide protection. They provide resources. They provide critical skills training. Mothers tend to be the caregiver. Fathers tend to be the trainer when it comes to, to life skills. Um, mothers do training in like language and things like that and, and, and in the more um, 
academic type skills as kids are growing up, but fathers tend to be more of the critical skills, um, teaching them uh, how to, to all in many ways, think and reason. And as children get older, fathers actually tend to provide more care than when they're younger, often teaching new skills and things like that. So fathers are, play more of a teacher role rather than a caregiver role. Doesn't mean mothers don't. Just in in general, fathers tend to do more of that, the more teaching role than they do actual direct caregiving role. Okay, the next thing we'll talk about then is the cost of men's short-term mating. So we kind of looked at this. Um, the, the, the cost of men's short-term mating, we looked at the costs of foregoing short-term mating, but what about the cost of actually engaging in short-term mating? Well, one of them is child survival is diminished. So children of two parents have an increased chance of survival. So children of with only one parent have a decreased chance of survival. What about cuckoldry? So in that case, so let's say a short-term mating results in an act of infidelity that's a short-term mating results in cuckoldry. So the person engaging in the short-term mating doesn't raise the child. Somebody who's not the biological father of the child raises them. Well, studies have shown that children raised in as a result of cuckoldry have a slightly higher chance of dying due to violence in the home. So even if it's not directly known, um, there might be things that are going on that results in the non-biological father, who's the long-term partner of the mother, committing infanticide, they where they kill their, their infant, or the infant that in this case is not theirs. The next cost is reputational damage. This isn't as big of a thing for men, but some men do receive reputational damage. They get a bad reputation for engaging in short-term mating. Um, especially if it's a man who's looking for a long-term partner. A man who is looking for a long-term partner who engages in, in acts of short-term mating may get a reputation for only being someone who's looking for short-term mating, and then women are less likely to choose them as a long-term partner. And then the final one, the one you see on the left, is diseases. Diseases can be an issue because the more partners you're with, the more chances of catching diseases you have. Let's look at some other ones. So some costs of short-term mating, potential retaliatory affairs by the wife. So for a guy that's in a long-term relationship, if he commits infidelity, has a short-term relationship um, with, with another woman, um, one thing that does happen in relationships where, where they stay together, it is likely that the partner will then be unfaithful. Violence at the hands of jealous and offended men and women. So you, you, the male partner of who you are having the short-term mating with could become violent. In guys who are interested in that person you're having the short-term mating with, it doesn't even have to be the male partner. Women who are interested in you as a male might become violent with you if you're engaged in short-term mating with others as well as your long-term partner. So there are a lot of potential costs for men to engage in short-term mating. We already talked about the benefits though, and that is increased mating opportunities. Evolutionarily, that, that has a very, very strong pull or a very, very strong selection pressure there. So there are some adaptive problems that men must overcome, solve, for short-term mating. When we're looking at adaptive problems, we're looking at evolutionarily here. Partner number. Um, so men who are engaged in short-term mating desire many sexual partners. What do they do in order to accommodate this? They lower their standards for short-term mating. We'll talk about this in subsequent slides, how men who are, who are looking for short-term mating partners lower their standards for partners. A problem is sexual accessibility. So the solution for that is focus on women who might be receptive to short-term mating. 
Another problem is commitment. So women are seeking commitment. So men to solve this will avoid women who expect and or can enforce commitment. We'll talk about this a bit more in a bit. Or they do things like emotionally disengage after mating. Competition is a challenge. So in order to do this, they, 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 what, what ends up happening is referred to as sperm competition. We'll talk about this. Really interesting stuff. And the last is they must avoid the costs of diseases, commitment, reputational damage, retaliatory affairs by the wife, violence, all of these things that are the cost. They need to do things to avoid these costs. Let's look at some of these. So first, let's look at one of these related to, I said, sperm competition. So sperm competition is where you, you basically get um, differences in, in, in sperm when you've got the potential to have multiple men have mated with a woman in a short period of time while she is ovulating, while she is fertile. So we're in, in situations where a female has the opportunity, doesn't necessarily mean she will, but has the opportunity to mate with multiple males, it will lead to adaptations for males to potentially rival or compete against the other males in ways that aren't direct aggression. One of these things is testicle size. One of these adaptations is testicle size. Larger testicle size means larger ejaculate load, more sperm. More sperm means if you're talking about a context of sperm competition, if you're talking about a context where more than one male has had sex with a female in while well, she was fertile in that period of time, a male who has more sperm means he is more likely that one of his sperm will will fertilize the egg. So in species in which each female in a group is likely to mate with many males, the social demand will select for males that can produce large number of sperm. Larger number of sperm is larger testes. So when we look at it, we've got over here, we've got gorillas and orangutans have very small testes. Why? Because there's alpha males in these species. There is less opportunities for the females to, to have short-term mating or commit acts which would be infidelity. So there's less opportunities for females to, to mate with multiple males. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, because it does. In both gorillas and orangutans, uh, there, there are sneaky males that will, will get in for mating opportunities. However, it is much less likely in those than it is in humans chimpanzees and bonobos. Chimpanzees and bonobos especially, there's lots of opportunities for mating, bonobos even worse, so the testes become became larger in order to increase ejaculate load. Humans are somewhere in the middle, there's less opportunities than chimpanzees and bonobos, but there's definitely more opportunities than gorillas and orangutans, so of the great apes, humans are somewhere in the middle. So, um, uh, evidence for this. One of the things that's been found that shows this uh, is men produce larger ejaculate loads if they've been away from their long-term partner for extended periods of time. Um, there's actually been studies done on this even more. So if, if a male's away from their partner for an extended period of time, increased chance their partner has been unfaithful. So regardless of whether he believes she's been unfaithful or not, there's larger ejaculate loads when he's been apart. But even on top of that, they found that, that men who suspect their wife of being unfaithful produce larger ejaculate loads. Uh, men who are being unfaithful themselves produce larger ejaculate loads. All of these things are relating to this, going back to this. Uh, I have a, a colleague um, she studies sperm competition at the University of Oakland and 
she studies things like this where she looks at, at the various different contexts that affect ejaculate size. And as you would su suspect from what I'm talking about here, anytime that there's any suspicion of infidelity, anytime there's, if they, so they, one of the studies that she's done is they prime people to, to have the thought in their head that their wife might have been or partner might have been unfaithful. And then they check their ejaculate size and compare that to when they haven't been primed for that. And they find that it does, it is larger when they've been primed for the possibility of infidelity. Let's look at another uh, th part of sperm competition that doesn't exactly relate to ejaculate size, and that is the shape of the penis. So penis morphology. The coronal ridge of the human penis. So the coronal ridge is going to be this ridge here. So you, there's none on this one here. You can see the one on this one here that's a bit bigger. Um, the one in A is is a deformed or a, a actually the one in A is a vaginal model inside, but the the B is the 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 phallus. The, the C is the control. What do we got? No, the B is phallus, C is control phallus, and D was another type of phallus. Um, so they, they've got different ones with different ridge sizes. And they tested this and tested to see what happened if thrusting occurred after an ejaculate load was there. And that is what happened is, is that it actually, the, the ones with the coronal ridge, displaced or pulled out some of the sperm. So this is a thing that is believed to now, now believed to be an adaptation specifically designed for removing ejaculate, removing sperm from a potential rival, and uh, that thus increasing the chances of that reproductive act resulting in pregnancy. Um, it's also why they found from that related to that why men stop thrusting as soon as they've ejaculated or they tend to because otherwise they would displace their own ejaculate. Um, and relating to that then, well if that's the case, if you've got the case there where, where you've got the, the this ridge is there to d designed to displace sperm from other men that, that have been potentially mated with that female before. Well, what they found is that, that men act who are, are who have a sus suspicion where they, they suspect that there's an increased likelihood of female infidelity. The female's away or they suspect her for, for, of being unfaithful. They actually thrust deeper and more vigorously as a result. Why? Because then that's an act of potentially trying to displace any that's already there. So just interesting things. The, there's believed to be more reasons for the coronal ridge adaptation, but one of the, the reasons for it is to displace potential rival sperm. How about that one I said where men should desire more sexual partners? Well, if if a male is looking for short-term mating opportunities, should have a, a larger number of desired partners. But even then, women should um, have fewer desired partners. Uh, and this just this doesn't even go back to short-term. This just goes back to men and women in general. We talked about in the last few weeks the different advantages and disadvantages for men and women. Well, the ideal number of sex partners for men should be much higher than it is for women. Conversely, the time elapsed between um, seeking in intercourse, uh, would you consent to having sex with an attractive member of the opposite sex after knowing them for um, how long? Uh, and it's going from right to left. So the only thing I don't like about this chart is it goes from right to left. Less time is on the right. So at, 
what's the likelihood of consenting to intercourse at one hour it is much higher for males than it is females after five years it comes out to about even but up up until about knowing each other for five years um it, it's men are much more likely to consent to sex with a attractive member of the opposite sex than women are so this goes back to that men desire their optimal number of partners is more and their their desire to engage in short-term mating is higher a, a study they did on this this is an interesting one so in this study uh, a a attractive female and a, a attractive male each approached members of the opposite sex in this so for this study they approached members of the opposite sex on campus and asked if they they would be willing to have sex with them none zero of the women agreed to have sex with the man who was just randomly approaching them to engage in in sex 75 percent of the women on the other hand or 75 percent of the men on the other hand agreed that with that they would have sex with the attractive opposite sex stranger who just approached them out of the blue on a campus men and women didn't differ in willingness to go on a date with the stranger so both men and women uh, when they walked around the they, so some people they asked for sex with some they asked for a date with when they asked for a date they they didn't differ in willingness to go on a date it only differed in willingness to engage in in this um short-term mating opportunity out of the blue um they did do subsequent studies of this and some women did agree but it still held pretty consistent that that almost all women said no and a majority of men said yes so i talked about that that lowering standards so the, this is the way to get more mating opportunities as a male one thing to do because there's so few mating opportunities is they lower their standards if they've got high standards then they're foregoing mating opportunities when men are looking for a longer term partner they they their standards are higher because they're that's someone they're going to be with and it's not as much about a miss mating opportunity for a long-term partner whereas short-term partners it's it's a miss mating opportunity to say no so or to not go after opportunities so to say so what is is found, been found here is that men relax their standards on most characteristics including intelligence wealth looks age emotional stability they that they they lower it for all of these when looking for a short-term partner actually the only thing they don't relax their standards on is women's sex drive so women with a low sex drive they they're they're still looking for a women with for a partner with a high sex drive relating to this actually so there's these re relaxed standards but it doesn't make sense for or evolutionarily men should be seeking out the the highest mate value partner they can for short short-term mating opportunities so when we're talking about relaxing standards they shouldn't actually relax standards at first it should be something that happens over time and that's actually what's been found it's what's referred to as and we'll get to it in just a second the the closing time effect so as the opportunity for finding mates decreases people become less selective and this is for both men and women they do this but men especially do this they become less selective as the the as time goes on so looking at this closing time effect um a in a study showed that the same undergraduate headshots they so they went around to this bar they showed um 100 bar patrons these same headshots at the beginning of the night and then at the end of the night and they actually kept track of these patrons to to check for things like alcohol consumed so they they were checking for that as well to make sure and we'll come back to that but they were looking at all this 
And they, they, they showed them at the beginning of the night and the end of the night. And as the night went on, the same photos were judged as increasingly attractive. So um, you get the, the time periods, um, the rating scale, uh, as you see for both men and women here. As time went on, the ratings of attractiveness went up. And you might think that this is just an effect of alcohol, beer goggles, as they're said. Um, but even when the, the, the number of alcoholic drinks was consumed was statistically controlled for, meaning that, that even with those who didn't drink or even when they, they took into account the drinking, this effect remained. So that's a that's one of those those interesting effects. We 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 have this tendency to believe that it's due to alcohol, and I'm not going to say alcohol doesn't have an effect in engaging in short-term mating, because it does. Alcohol lowers your inhibitions, so therefore you're you're more likely to engage in sh in a short-term mating opportunity when you've been consuming alcohol. Uh, again, that's just because of lowered inhibitions. If you aren't someone who would be willing to do that ever anyway, alcohol is not going to get you to the point where you're willing to do it. All it is is it's lowering inhibitions that are in place. Even with that lowered inhibitions taken into account, this closing time effect remains. That is, as time goes on through the night, as mating opportunities decreases, men and women relax their standards for sexual partners. How about that one I said, minimizing commitment after sex? So in a study by Hazelton and Buss, and you'll see Hazelton come up often. This is a lot of what she works on. Of course, you're seeing Buss come up a lot because it's his book, but this is his field basically. But Hazelton was one of his grad students and she did a lot of research in these domains. And she showed that men who reported many sexual partners were more likely to also report finding their partner substantially less attractive after intercourse. So men who have multiple, multiple partners, men who, who seek out short-term mating, they find their partner more attractive before sex than they do after sex. And this is a way to mentally disengage, a way to mentally not form a commitment is by finding them less attractive. I'm not going to say this is moral or not. I'm just talking about the, the basics here. Let's talk about another effect that's interesting here, and that is the Coolidge effect. So the Coolidge effect, let's get to that. President Kelvin Coolidge and his wife allegedly visited a government farm one day and were taken around on separate tours. Mrs. Coolidge, passing the chicken pen, inquired of a supervisor whether the lone rooster was sufficient given the many hens in the, the chicken flock. Uh, yes, the man said, the rooster works very hard. Mrs. Coolidge then replied, really? The rooster works very hard every day? The man said, yes, dozens of times a day. Interesting, Mrs. Coolidge replied. Be sure to tell that to the president. Sometime later, the president passing the same pens was told about the roosters and about his wife's remark. And he asked the same hen every time. And the supervisor said, no, oh no, a different hen each time. And president Coolidge said, tell that to Mrs. Coolidge with a sly nod. Basically, this comes down to the effect, the Coolidge effect, is that uh, that males, when in the presence or when having multiple mating opportunities with multiple different females, they are more likely to want to engage in copulation and there's less refractory period. So the refractory period is the time after a male engages in in sex after he ejaculates there's a period of time before he can um, basically engage in sex again what's actually been found is and we'll talk about this a little bit in the next few slides but what, what's actually been found is is that that refractory period is less if the female is a different female than the original female so when you're talking about multiple different partners the, the refractory period becomes less down to possibly even nothing or next to nothing. This Coolidge effect has been found in male rats, sheep, cattle, rhesus monkeys, rhesus monkeys, even evidence of it in females too. Females who, who have multiple male partners are become more interested in sex quicker afterwards. Females don't have the same type of refractory period, 
but they do have a period after intercourse where they become less interested. When there's multiple male partners, though, that period goes away. Kind of relating to that, let's look at what men and women, a start here of what men and women look for in short-term partners by looking at fantasies. So male fantasies tend to be multiple partners, often strangers, and this gets back to that what I've been talking about. It's no commitment with multiple opportunities, whereas female fantasies, which is mostly romance novels, so where women do look at pornography, but the things they look for tend to be different, and that's why romance novels are being used here. So f female fantasies typically have a single partner currently or a partner that they were previously romantic with, Male, it's impersonal with no commitment. Again, lack of commitment, whereas females, it's emotional with the romantic context with the potential for commitment there. Um, males move rapidly to the sexual encounter. Females move slowly to it or look for moving slowly to it. And this goes back to, again, males are, are interested in all those mating opportunities. Females are interested more in making sure that the male is committed. Uh, the male fantasies tend to be highly visual, include genitals and breasts, where the female fantasies tend to be less visual. However, it's still, again, like I said, it's not like women don't look at, at pornography. We just, we, we see differences in what is typically looked at. How about prostitution? So... Uh, there's sex differences in prostitution. The majority of um, people engaging in prostitution, the majority of prostitutes, um, first off, let's say this. Prostitution exists in every large society that's been well studied throughout history. It, it's there. Even in societies where it's very taboo, prostitution still exists. Prostitution goes back. It's got this reputation as the oldest profession um i don't know how much you could you could study that to find out or, or i don't know if it's even possible but the point is is prostitution isn't something that's like on the fringes of society prostitution something that is historically well documented um and common very very common so when you've got this situation of prostitution what has been found is, is it's almost always men paying women. Almost all of the prostitutes are women, and almost all of the, the people paying prostitutes for sex are men. That doesn't mean there isn't men that are prostitutes, and actually the, the majority of men who are prostitutes are actually getting paid by men as well. Um, it's actually very few men who are getting paid by women. Um, and there's also women that get paid by women too, but the, the majority of people paying prostitutes are men. Why is that the case? Because when it comes to this, we've talked about with short-term mating and short-term mating opportunities, men are interested in as many as they can get. Women usually don't have as much trouble getting short-term mating opportunities. In addition to that, women aren't typically looking for short-term mating opportunities. They're looking for long-term mating opportunities and commitment. Relating to that, um, you even get very like high status men or high profile men or attractive men, all of these things that would make a man a very high um, value short-term mating partner who end up paying for prostitutes. Uh, men who have very attractive partners, things like that. Uh, men who have very high mate value partners. So um, uh, Hugh Grant cheated on uh, Elizabeth Hurley and she very attractive. Um, the, the, even the prostitute that he cheated on her with, that, that he hired, said, I can't believe that Hugh Grant wanted to pay me to sleep with him. But he was because Again, it goes back. We Men have very strong evolved preferences to engage in short-term mating opportunities. Uh, instances like that, um, you, you look at instances like why did Tiger Woods cheat on his uh, supermodel wife? It, it goes back 
and, and potentially risk half of his wealth. It goes back to, to this. Men have evolved a strong preference for engaging in short-term mating. So men who have the opportunity to engage in short-term mating. So men who are higher mate value. Men who are rich. Men who are attractive. Men who are dominant men who, who, who have high social status, these types of things. These men are actually more likely to commit infidelity than lower mate value men are because they've got more opportunities to in this strong evolved drive to engage in it. That doesn't mean that all men are going to, to engage in infidelity, but there is this increased chance for men who are higher mate value themselves. Okay, let's talk about something that, that is actually kind of scary when it comes down to it. But we'll talk about this in terms of short-term mating. So that is, so we, we just talked about a whole bunch of adaptations that, that men and, and women as well have for short-term mating. The question is, do they succeed? Do men actually succeed at short-term mating? Because if they don't actually, and when we're talking about short-term mating here, we're not just talking about, X where where they become they they leave a woman who is single as a a single mother. No, we're typically talking about acts here that are more in line with they are with a woman who is committing infidelity and then cuckoldry occurs and another man raises the offspring. But in general, what we're we're talking about here is where um are men getting women pregnant in short-term mating? We've got an environmental mismatch now. We've got a time now where contraceptives and all that are present. But if we look at back in time, that wouldn't have been there. So in those cases, it is possible that a lot of short-term mating opportunities ended up in pregnancies. In even industrial societies now, 30 to 50% of men and women typically report having at least one extramarital affair, although males, you, males usually give higher estimates. So what you've got here is up to 50% of people cheat on their partner. Something just to keep in mind. Um, even when we look at like tribal societies, societies where where there there isn't the same like societal pressures as today even in those you find pretty consistent for infidelity so infidelity isn't just possible it's actually relatively common um and interestingly enough when they started doing things like um being able to do dna tests to see if people were the biological offspring of whoever they thought their father was, things like that. They did different tests for different reasons. Um, one study showed that in men who suspect who that they are not the biological fathers of their offspring. So the key here is they already have a suspicion. For some reason, maybe the kid doesn't look like them. Maybe infidelity occurred, so they suspect. In men who suspect that they're not the biological father, about 20 to 30 percent of the time they were correct they were not the biological father such suspicious, suspicious cases are rare the overall rate is probably closer to five to ten percent though newer evidence is actually staying higher nobody really studies this because nobody wants to be the one to say okay we're going to study and, and see if you're the actual biological offspring of who you say your father is who you think your father is or go to fathers and say we're going to test to see if they're actually your biological offspring no most people don't want to know that it's it's a bit unethical to do it in the first place actually that's why um dna testing like 23 and me are actually banned in um france it's because they're considered unethical because if people find out they're they're not the biological offspring of their father, it can cause issues. So they're actually they're illegal in France unless you've got an actual genetic reason like a health condition. Um, but so studies aren't done here. But from evidence from people who work in fields that deal with these DNA tests, so people, for instance, who do stuff like um, they they test DNA to see if people are matches for um, organ donors 
if the person ends up not being a biological offspring or biologically related to the person they're trying to give an organ donor to, they don't actually tell them that they're not related. They just tell them they're not a match because they don't want to deal with all those issues. But when these the, the people who do this type of testing, they, they got to communicating their results. And they actually say that the, the data they're finding is it's actually about 20% of people are not the biological offspring of who they think their father is. That's a scary number. We're not talking about one in a hundred that, that where infidelity is resulting in, in reproduction, that, that cuckoldry occurs where a male raises an offspring that, that isn't theirs. We're talking up to one in five children are not actually the biological offspring of who they think their father is. So that is something that when we look at, we then have to say, okay, then yes, it is very likely that these adaptations for short-term mating are working. It is occurring. So now we have to ask ourselves a question. That is, it's, it, first off, it's clear that men have evolved a suite of adaptations designed to facilitate a short-term mating strategy. But when we look at it mathematically, the number of short-term matings must be identical for the sexes, given an equal operational sex ratio. Basically, it means that men and women, they engage in the same amount of short-term mating. Now, obviously, sometimes uh, women think it's long-term and men engage in short-term. There is that, but it, typically it's not. that's not going to be the case. Typically, it's going to be more of consensual short-term mating, meaning not for long-term, even if it repeats. So the question then becomes, why would women engage in short-term mating? So we have that question. Why would women engage in short-term mating? And when we look at this, we have to really consider this question because there are a lot of costs to women uh, engaging in short-term mating. There's costs like damage to reputation. Women who, who engage in infidelity, who engage in sex outside of a, of a long-term relationship, it's not as much anymore, but it's still a big uh, social faux pas. It, it, but it, it, it definitely, historically, it's been something that led to really negative reputations. Men, we talked about how men can get a bad reputation, but women will get a bad re reputation if it's found out they're engaging in short-term mating, especially for infidelity. Um, loss of partner. If they get caught, they, they could lose their partner, their long-term partner. And again, we talked about all the benefits of a, of a long-term partner for the woman and raising the children. Loss of the partner's investment. Um, so a partner who may stay with his partner, but he might invest less in the relationship. Not to mention, I, I mentioned this before, but higher rates of infanticide um, and abortion rates amongst unmarried, uh, it, just because it comes back to they don't have the investment of the partner. And if they get pregnant, especially when they're not in a long-term relationship, men are less likely to get into a relationship with them. There's increased offspring conflict if they have different fathers. So biological, full biological offspring have less conflict than half siblings. There's the risk of physical and sexual abuse that comes along with the infidelity and with the, the, the short-term mating. There's the risk of unwanted pregnancy. The conscious act of, of engaging in the short-term mating isn't likely to be a desire for pregnancy, but it still is something that can happen. And finally, just like men, the risk of disease. So if there's all these negatives, if there's all these drawbacks, there must be benefits as well, otherwise women wouldn't engage in it. One of the benefits is immediate resources or services. Um, and this isn't just prostitution, but prostitution is something that this occurs with, but just it's even women who aren't engaging in prostitution, uh, when they engage in short-term mating, they, they are at an increased likelihood 
of getting something out of it. We're not just talking about the sex. Um, drinks bought for them, food bought for them, gifts are common. Even when it's not paying for sex, it's paying for sex. Another benefit is paternity confusion. So if there's two different males that think they might be the father, both of them might invest resources. If one person thinks they're the father and another person who, who the woman committed the act of infidelity with also thinks they're the father but isn't like advertising that the infidelity occurred, he might give the woman resources so for the kid that, that he thinks is his while well, she's also getting resources from her long-term partner. There's the good gene sexy sons hypothesis. This is that twofold. First, that if she chooses a short-term partner who is a higher mate value short-term partner, he's healthier, he's more masculine, he's more muscular, all of those, then first, he's likely to have good genes meaning he's like the offspring, not the person that the short-term mating occurs with, because the person the short-term mating occurs with is chosen for because they have good genes. They're, again, attractive, muscular, masculine, all of these things. Then they will pass on those genes to the kids so their kids will have good genetics. So a, a reason for this might be if you're, especially if you're with a partner who has lower genetic value, to have an act of infidelity with someone who's higher genetic value means that your offspring will be of higher genetic value. And then the other side of that is sexy sons. Men who are attractive have sons who are attractive. So the, the sons that you have have an increased likelihood of reproducing themselves. So you get different and better genes. Another benefit is mate switching. Um, women commit infidelity in short-term mating before divorce, before disillusion of a relationship in order to switch up to a better long-term mate, especially if during the, the relationship that the female became a better, ha increased her mate value. It's one of the reasons why in a relationship, if one person loses weight, it can, the, you have the increased likelihood of relationship disillusion and infidelity because that person is increasing their mate value, but the other is not. Mate skill acquisition. Um, some women will engage in short-term mating uh, when they're, they're younger in order to get better at the skills needed to obtain a better long-term mate later. And finally is mate manipulation, gaining revenge, increasing commitment of their regular mate, things like that. This can really backfire, but some women will engage in this in, in an effort to possibly get more commitment from their long-term partner, especially if their long-term partner is a bit maybe lower mate value. So when we look at this, we'll look at some comparative psychology here. So studies of non-human primate primates indicate that females reduce infanticide risk by mating with multiple males. Um, once a male has mated with a female, his likelihood of killing her offspring declines drastically because they could potentially be his. And the male will be more likely to defend those offspring, uh, potentially his, against other males trying to take over the troop. And this is, is translates over into humans to a lesser extent because, it, it, again, if, if that child is possibly yours, you're likely to, more likely to defend it, keep it alive, give resources, things like that. Let's look at that good genes thing I was talking about. So symmetrical men, what thing rated attractiveness. You've got Fabio here. He's ancient now, but back when he was younger, he was like the, the, prototypical for what women were looking for in men. Muscular, symmetrical, long hair, all of the things, again, tall, all of those things. So when it comes down to it, what, what does that translate into? Well, men that are more attractive like this, more symmetrical, report having more extra pair copulations, meaning they report having more short-term mating opportunities. And women report that when seeking short-term partners, they actually place more emphasis on attractiveness 
and a man's desirability to other women than they look for in a long-term mate. So a long-term mate has certain qualities that a woman, look, woman looks for. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. A short-term mate has different qualities. The qualities a short-term mate, a woman's looking for in a short-term mate, lend more to their, their indications of good genes. They look for men who are daring, confident, strong, humorous. They, they report preferring men with masculine faces and bodies. So why aren't they looking for these masculine faces and bodies um, when, when they're, they're looking for a long-term partner? Well, you'll have to come back to that. We'll talk about that in two slides. So they're looking for men who potentially have good genetics for a short-term partner. So let's look at how changes in mate preference change along the ovulatory cycle. So when women are ovulating or just prior to ovulation, women's change, preferences change. They prefer men who are taller. They prefer men who are more masculine. They prefer, prefer more creative intelligence to show that there's even things that are not physical. Um, they display social presence and social competitiveness. They, they prefer men who do that. So uh, all of these things go up right around ovulation. So there's all of these things and new features are being identified all the time. All of these things that women prefer at a different rate when they're ovulating or near when they're ovulating. So you've got this high masculinity. High masculinity indicates good genes um, and, and women seek this out to, to have offspring that have potentially have these good genes. But this goes back to that question I just asked a minute ago. Why are women only seeking this when they're looking for a short-term partner? Why don't they look for a long-term partner who's a macho man or bad boy? And that, that is just because they don't tend to make good long-term partners or even friends. A female can find a male that's a masculine, that's strong, that's tough, all of this attractive as a short-term partner, can obtain his genes, but then try to get commitment benefits from a man in, for a long-term relationship um, that is better suited for the long-term relationship. Men who are masculine tend to be more aggressive. They tend to be more um, abusive. It's, it's straight up testosterone can lead to more aggression. So men who are more masculine they, there's a higher likelihood that they will abuse their partners and their offspring. So seeking out long-term partnerships with them isn't necessarily ideal. Long-term partnerships are sought out for those who are more stable and can dedicate more resources. So they get commitment, women can get commitment benefits from one male and genetic benefits from another. So let's go back to sperm selection, um, sperm competition. Uh, and when we look at the good genes hypothesis, uh, female orgasm includes muscular cervical contractions. Um, some believe that this, the, attribute this to the upsuck hypothesis. That is, uh, orgasm actually leads to sucking sperm in deeper. So if that is true, then women who are, are mating with men who have better genes should have more orgasms, regardless of, of quality of the sex. And what's been found is that women who have extra pair copulations, when they're more likely to ovulate, actually um, are more likely to have orgasms with these extra pair, with these extra pair copulation partners. So the, the orgasm might be an adaptation for obtaining good genes. So they're, they're having more short-term mating, extra pair copulations when they're ovulating. That, that's consistent with evolutionary theory. And they're having more orgasms when they're with their extra pair copulation partner, which again potentially supports this. So the benefits to women of short-term mating Another one is mate switching. 
Uh, women who have affairs report that they are generally less happy with their long-term partner, emotionally or sexually, so they are more likely to, to engage in this infidelity. Um, they report being more likely to engage in extra prayer copulations if their long-term partner was also having an affair, was abusive to her, was uninterested in having sex with her, all things that could lead her to basically seek relationship with another, potentially a long-term relationship. So the short-term relationship is a stepping stone to the long-term. And women state that extra prayer copulations would make it easier to break up with their long-term partner and would increase their odds of entering a long-term relationship with a better partner. Um, men do this too, but, but women are, are likely to go from one relationship to another without much time between, likely because in some instances they were already having an affair with that person that they switched to the relationship with. Again, this isn't a universal, not all women do this, and men do it too. Okay, this set of slides is going to be really long, so this lecture is going to be really long, so I'm going to break it up into two parts. This is the end of the first part. Um, look on uh, Blackboard for the second part. Thanks. Come on back.